Welcome to part four of our series on the common fallacies of theism and statism, and this week we look at a curious mentality that they both possess. The inability to conceive of a system of bottom-up spontaneous order and thinking that all forms of organization must be managed from the top down. It's easy to see this happening with theism, especially creationism. How many times have you heard this? When was the last time an explosion resulted in a fully assembled 747? So the idea is that even if you had all the parts of an airplane, just tossing in a stick of dynamite and expecting them to spontaneously assemble is ridiculous. And it is. But then they use this to try and say that evolution just can't happen. Evolution just can't happen! See? But there are problems here. Jets are not alive. Jets do not reproduce. Jets do not mutate. And the parts of jets don't have affinities for one another the way natural biological components do. Years back, Charles Kopeck posted a brilliant video to YouTube where he examined a similar analogy from creationists. Take apart a clock, put the parts in a box, shake it up, and you don't get an assembled clock. But Kopeck showed, using genetic algorithms, that if you use the evolutionary process, a bottom-up system of spontaneous order, you can get really accurate two, three, and even four-handed clocks without anyone having to design a thing. But why take Kopeck's word for it? You can check it out for yourself. Just go to boxcar2d.com and see evolution in action for yourself. It starts off with random cars that don't do much other than fall apart. But just by chance, some of them work kinda sorta okay, going forward a little bit. The ones that work better breed the next generation, with random mutations, and some of those work a little better still. Before too long, you can get some pretty clever cars that perform amazingly without any human input at all. Or take a look at the creations from Lee Graham's algorithm. This end-over-end -end worm evolved from creatures that didn't function nearly as well. In fact, the first generation, randomly generated, could do little more than fall over and maybe wiggle. This is the result of generations of evolution, again with no human input at all. Okay, but that's just playing around on a computer. I bet it doesn't have practical uses. You lose that bet. Check this out. This antenna was evolved, not designed, by NASA for its ST-5 spacecraft. Starting with random bent pieces of metal, the ones that worked better as antennae were used to breed the next generation, which mutated. After several generations, they came up with an antenna that was far superior to the helix design humans had come up with before, all without any human influence whatsoever on the design. The problem is, when human beings see systems acting in a certain way, we tend to attribute agency to them. When we see a system that appears organized, it's tough for us to believe that it's happening spontaneously. We think there must be a single mind somewhere directing it. But science has shown that it ain't necessarily so, and an excellent example of this is a flock of starlings. Starlings move around in a most unusual fashion. Unlike some other migratory birds, there's no leader. No one starling is showing the others where to go. Further, there's no hierarchy of leaders and followers. Each starling is a peer in this system. Here's how it works. Each starling moves in the same direction as the others. Each starling tries to stay close, but not too close, to its neighbors. And starlings also avoid collisions. These three simple rules are all that's needed to reproduce this amazing flight pattern in computer simulations. Of course, there's some other stuff going on. As migratory birds, starlings are influenced by magnetic lines. There are rules for when they land to rest and take off again, that sort of thing. But the thing about it that's a bit hard to believe but is absolutely true is that even in flocks of hundreds of thousands of starlings, no starling needs to know about any more than its seven nearest neighbors. That's it. This is spontaneous bottom-up organization of the kind that tends to flummox both theists and statists alike. So how do statists fall into this trap? It's because they have the same incredulity about society doing things without government, 
particularly in regards to the economy and the market. Hear it from Chris Clark of Free Thought Blogs. Libertarians postulate that unfettering everyone's most self-serving economic motives is the best way to create a vibrant, egalitarian economy, just as unfettering a giant, unstable slope of rocks on a steep hillside is the best way to create a stone cathedral at the base of the hill. Sound familiar? Yep, it's just the old 747 argument all over again. By not understanding that the market is fundamentally a bottom-up system of self-organization, they fall into precisely the same trap as the creationists who insist that there must be a god because life couldn't form any other way. But wait a minute! You guys have the invisible hand! That's the same thing, isn't it? Actually, no it isn't. The invisible hand is a metaphor, first described by economist Adam Smith. In the theory of moral sentiments, he wrote, The rich only select from the heap what is most precious and agreeable, though they mean only their own conveniency, though the sole end which they propose from the labors of all the thousands whom they employ be the gratification of their own vain and insatiable desires, they divide with the poor the produce of all their improvements. They are led by an invisible hand to make nearly the same distribution of the necessities of life of which would have been made had the earth been divided into equal portions among its inhabitants, and thus without intending it, without knowing it, advance the interests of the society and afford means to the multiplication of the species. He expanded on this idea in The Wealth of Nations. Every individual necessarily labors to render the annual revenue of the society as great as he can. He generally, indeed, neither intends to promote the public interest nor knows how much he is promoting it. He intends only his own security, and by directing that industry in such a manner as its produce may be of the greatest value, he intends only his own gain, and he is in this, as in many other cases, led by an invisible hand to promote an end which was no part of his intention. By pursuing his own interest, he frequently promotes that of the society more effectually than when he really intends to promote it. So the point of the invisible hand is not that there's some mysterious top-down force directing the market. The point is, there's not one. This is a metaphor. It only appears as though there's an invisible hand. And so when we look at it, we tend to associate it with an agency. It really does seem like statist atheists gave up on the notion of God as a top-down designer, but just couldn't get their brains to think bottom-up, so they had to come up with a replacement. And there was the state, all ready to claim credit. Well, if that's the case, I have an object right here in my hand that will make you quake in your boots. The object of your pain that takes your precious statist delusion and stomps on it tears it to shreds, and flushes down the toilet. It's right here. Get ready to quake. It's a pencil! But you're... You're not quaking. Why are you not quaking? You're supposed to be quaking, but I'm sensing a distinct lack of quakage. Oh, I know, you're not quaking because there's a fact about this pencil that you don't know. That if you did, would cause all of these status claims to fall apart. And that fact is this. No one in the world knows how to make a pencil. Oh, come on. Someone knew how to make a pencil. Otherwise, how did it get made? Well, how do you think it got made? Well, someone took some graphite, put it in between a couple of pieces of wood, and clamped a piece of rubber onto it with a bit of metal. Okay, what kind of wood? I'll tell you then. It's called incense cedar, and it grows in the northwestern U.S. So do you know how the cedar is cut, shaped, pressure treated? And incense cedar is white. It's colored for pencils because people like the looks of it. Do you know how? And using what kind of pigment? And you mentioned the graphite. Well, graphite's a powder. So how do you get it into this solid form so you can make marks on paper with it? You have to mix it with clay and burn it in a kiln. 
Do you know how hot? And for how long? What kind of clay? And what proportions? And you mentioned rubber for the eraser, but the rubber doesn't really erase marks, it's just there to hold it together. Do you know what erasers are really made of? Well, it's usually some kind of gum made from soy. Do you know how to grow and harvest soy? And it's usually solidified with something like sulfur chloride. Do you know how to get sulfur chloride? How to handle it safely? And how to mix it with the soy and the rubber to get the eraser? Actually, the rubber they use nowadays is synthetic. How is that made? And from what? And that bit of metal. What kind of metal is it? Where do you mine it? How do you refine it? Hey, it has to be painted, too. What kind of pigment is used? What kind of oils? How are they extracted from nature and mixed together? And how do you make all of the tools, saws, digging equipment, kilns, and everything else that's used to get all these materials extracted, shaped, and delivered? Oh yes, they have to be delivered from all over the world. The components have to be shipped in boats or on planes and trucks. And so we have all of the people who drive these vehicles and who manage them and plot out the routes. And at the factory where they're assembled, well, how do you build the factory? Pour the concrete? Mix the concrete? Where do the materials to make concrete even come from? And the steel and the plastic and everything else that goes into it? The fuels to run it? Or generating the electricity? And then there's the workers. They all need to eat that hamburger they have for lunch. People need to grow the cattle and slaughter them and prepare them. Lots of things that lots of people do before it even gets to the restaurant that fries it. And of course, the hamburger needs to be fried on grills made from metal and Teflon. Do you know how Teflon is made? And then there's the oil it's fried in, raising the vegetables for that, and the wheat and everything else that goes into the bun. Milling the flour on and on and on. The coffee they drink on their breaks with beans from South America, and the soda they have with lunch. Do you know how to carbonate water? Do you know how phosphoric acid is made? What about the sweetener? Growing and refining cane sugar, or corn syrup, or an artificial sweetener such as aspartame? What about the kind of paper it's wrapped in? What about- Oh now, wait a minute. You're talking about what they eat, not what they make pencils with. So what? They still have to eat, don't they? And I'm not even scratching the surface here. They have to go to work in cars or buses or ride bicycles. So we have all of the things that go into manufacturing internal combustion engines and tires and steering wheels and seats and... Okay, okay, I get the idea! Do you? You also need to realize that a lot of people whose time, labor, and ingenuity went into all of the things that go into making a pencil are long dead. The people who invented the technology develop the processes. Today's engineers and designers are just standing on their shoulders. Okay, yeah, but... But nothing! You've also got the developments that people made, not just independently of making pencils, like making trucks and things like that, but things that happened because pencils were being made. Pencils used to be made out of eastern red cedar. Who was it that figured out incense cedar was better? And how? For that matter, the lead in the pencil is called that because it used to be made of lead. Who figured out that graphite was better, and how? We may not know any of that, but we do know the why. Because people want pencils, and finding a better wood to make them out of, or a better material used to make the lead, or the eraser, or whatever, is a great way to make a profit. Well, yeah, they did it to make a profit, not to help people! But that's exactly the point. Most of the people whose time and labor and ingenuity go into making a pencil don't even realize that their product will be used that way. And the ones who do are not doing it because they want you to have a pencil. They most likely don't even know you or will ever meet you. Millions of people play a role in making a pencil. And like the starlings, they don't need to know about any more than a handful of the others. There is not one single person, not even the designers at the pencil companies, not even the CEOs, who know all the steps that go into making a pencil. And even if you took everyone in the pencil company and put them in a place with only natural resources and none of the other things I mentioned in ready-made form for them to use, they wouldn't even know where to begin to get the things they need to make pencils. This all happens with no mastermind, no intelligent designer at the top directing all of this. 
And this is just a pencil. Can you imagine how much more complex this phenomenon is with something like, say, a smartphone? But don't we need government to do all that? How? How is government going to get all the information they need to make a pencil? We've pretty thoroughly established that no one person or even one cohesive group of people could possibly know all the steps for making a pencil. And government is just a group of people. They have no way of gaining this knowledge, no way of directing the steps, and trying to butt in to manipulate even one part of this process is inefficient at best and at worst harmful to real people, to even their very health and livelihood. But that's social Darwinism! Is it? Let's compare this with evolution then, since you insist. Evolution is a natural bottom-up process. Try and control or direct that process from the top down, and you get eugenics. And we saw how well that worked out. So if anything, it's government regulation and manipulation that's the social Darwinism here. But we need government to protect jobs! Protect them from whom? When cars came out, people stopped buying buggy whips. Do you know what happened to the people who made buggy whips? Uh, they starved? Or, no! They went on to do other things. Maybe instead of making buggy whips, they made fan belts or something. Saying that these people would starve if they went out of business is exactly as ridiculous as saying that all of the people who sell iPhones wouldn't have a job if it weren't for iPhones. They'd just be selling something else, or have a career doing something different. As long as government isn't monkeying around with the economy and creating unemployment, that is. So the next time you feel incredulous about such and such happening without government, the next time you feel like asking, who will build the roads? The next time you feel like agreeing with a president who says, you didn't build that, remember the pencil. And the buggy whip. And the creative forces of the market that stem from no central authority, but from the individual autonomous actions of profit-seeking individuals. And understand that every single thing you have, no matter how much government may want to claim credit for it, is the result of millions of people working together peacefully and voluntarily to make it happen, even if they don't even realize that's what they're doing. And above all, understand that whether you're talking about God or government, your incredulity, your feeling that certain things just aren't possible without either of those, means nothing. But that's the subject of part five. Stay tuned.